coming to you live from inside my office on the couch with Steve Aoki. It's so great to see you, Steve. Yeah, it's nice to meet you um, in your uh, office. So here cool. in my office, try and keep things comfortable. I like yeah. that you've already put your feet up. That's great. We will take your questions. I'm ha I've got my phone here. I'm not. I'm not going to be looking at my phone because while, while I'm not interested. <laughs> but um, I'm following along your questions. So definitely shoot me your questions. Let us know on Facebook what you want to ask Steve Aoki. Um, peace. Peace. Peace what, around the world. You, so for, for people out there who aren't as familiar with you, how did the, the cake throwing at fans and the crowd surfing in the boat, how did that start? Okay, so every artist that, you know, that had, does a thing on stage, they will, you always, everyone wants to think of their own shtick or right. their own thing. You need you know? a thing. Yeah, like you try, I mean, everyone's trying, right? To do something that, that defines or like it's a signature of their show. So um, in 2009, that's when I, you know, I really was methodical with my set. I was playing Coachella. I was like, I got to do something different. And there's certain things that stuck and some certain, things, certain things that didn't stick. And the boat was something that people liked. <laughs> and then like a couple years later, I was like, I got to add something else. And so I, I was like, oh, maybe I try throwing a cake in someone's face and put it on my YouTube page. <laughs> And then it, it just, it's, it's sticky, no pun intended, you know, it's it just like people liked it. So, um, yeah, at this point, six years, six, six years. years. Do you feel, do you feel pressure to change it up to do something new? I'm always thinking of new stuff, but it's re it's really hard, you know, like you, I, I've, I've, um, brought in this thing, this idea called neon future technology. And I have like these appendages that's, that shoot CO2 and I'm like half a robot, but it's like, <laughs> I don't know, people don't like yo I love that but like you know everyone loves the cake more and you know. cows shoot co2 as well right what's that cows cows I think cows um, out their butt they yeah, yeah something along those lines yeah I well in my shows I don't is do that what you're trying butt. to do I, <laughs> that could are be you idea. trying to emulate the cows <laughs> <laughs> I could wear like some jet pack and like almost be this do the same thing that, that uh, what cool. hasn't worked have there been any because you mentioned like in the beginning when you were starting out what doesn't work what do you um, think doesn't work with connecting what, with fans in general right spraying, now? Spraying, uh, well, I brought these um, the super soaker guns. Yes. I was like, oh, this is going to be cool, like on summer, yeah. you know, hot, everyone's sweaty. But no one wants to get a like <laughs> thin stream of water spraying in their face. Right in, in the their, face. Yeah, so that uh. does, that's, that, I, th I threw that out immediately. I'm like, this is horrible. <laughs> I'm, 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 everyone's here to have a good time, not, not like, you know. But if you get sprayed with water, like, showered yeah then it's all right interesting so it's just a, it's presentation how you deliver it yeah so presentation such an important part of your yeah. entire career um you're now in the clothing business yes. men's clothing yes tell me about that okay so uh tomorrow we're going to be showing our fashion show at new york fashion week with cfda congratulations thank you it's it was it's been a long time coming um it's our fifth collection our four collections we did in Japan, and we're finally launching in America, and um, uh, it's it's like it's really difficult. It's a very difficult business. I've been in fashion in one form form or another for like nine, ten years now. Hmm. I started DJing, trading DJing services for a, a, a booth at Magic Trade Show 2006. So I've been trying to do a line, and finally now I have a full a full scale collection, and. Um, and it like and it brings back to my roots of kind of like more it's like a punk energy. Um, we uh, we made the um, the runway a skate ramp. Mm. So I want to be disruptive. I want to try something different. I want to introduce my line in the way that I would want to introduce it. And um, and and the collection's incredible. It's like it's very it's really cool. It's got a lot of energy. Um, uh, David Cho, one of my favorite artists, did all the graphics and his band's playing as well. So Very cool. Josh Rodriguez wants to know what's Steve's next move in terms of artistic goals and I'm going to add on to that. Do you feel pressure nowadays as an artist that you have to do everything? Like you can't just be in one spot anymore as an artist. You have to have your clothing line and maybe a drink and <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Not sponsored by Steve Aoki but um. I've always been the kind of person that's that's just following my inspiration. It doesn't have to be one thing, mm -hmm. you know. So, 
Um, and plus you want like, it's, you know, you try one thing, you always want to like change it up and see if something else fits in your shoes too. So, um, but I know plenty of people that just like, just focus on one thing. You know, you don't have to do a million things. I'm always going to try to focus on things that I'm going to follow my gut, follow my passion. And, um, and sometimes it takes longer than others. Like doing this line took a long time. What was know? the toughest part about doing a clothing line? Uh, well, for one, it's extremely expensive. The you cost know, of just getting the, into the, the business, cost, manufacturing, oh God, textiles, yes. people. All of that. All of the above. And, and huge risks associated with it. Massive risk. It's like, it's almost like 90% risk. Mm. So for me, now since I make my money doing music, I don't, with fashion, I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this because I, I love, it's my passion project. And it's something that I've been, I've been silk screening shirts since I was 15. Hmm. My mom's house. So, um, it's like I don't. It's not necessarily about how much money can I make from it. It's how, how much, how I can turn this into a sustainable business, and then still continue to pump out like really great stuff. That's, you know, it's a, it's like a, you know, appendage of my artistic freedom and be able to do some really cool stuff with great people. So you mentioned your mom. She comes up a lot in your documentary. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Nominated for a Grammy, best music video in the yeah, in the Grammys. Right, yeah. um, and your father also comes up. For those of you who are not familiar, his father is Rocky Aoki, the creator of Benihana. How much of a role would you say your parents play in your life now in terms of how you create, how you see the world? Um, I think they're always unconsciously, subconsciously there. You know, um, like in the early stages, it was a really big deal because he was he was alive and he was very much a part of my my development whether he whether i like he liked it or i liked it you know because i was rebelling against his whole thing and then i just then i realized i wanted i wanted his attention at the end of the day you were so young when you got into music as a businessman was he worried about that oh yeah yeah of course music was a distraction to what you know i was like okay that's child's play I get it, have fun with it, but then you're going to have to grow up and get a job and, and deal with real life situations and, and scenarios. And, and uh, it was true in the fact that being in a band and starting a label and the whole thing was really not making much money for me. So, you know, from his perspective, the rationale was grow up, you know, and it's, it was, uh, I, I had to just kind of splinter off and just like, just do my own thing. He's not going to support me financially if he doesn't agree with that kind of life, mm -hmm. you know, which I understand. And, um, and then I realized I have to make this into a business if I'm going to really survive. And then I was like, I'm going to show him. I'm going to prove to him. I'm going to do it, you know. And, and now you're one of the highest paid DJs of all time. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. but Well, I'm you're <laughs> on the Forbes and the Fortune list of highest paid, so. I'm definitely, I'm definitely like very grateful Yes. For to be able to turn this into a, a you know a career, and then I could do things like things I love, like like my fashion line and you know everything else. Anthony Joseph Morrison says, "Saw you in Ibiza two years ago. It was magical. When are you performing in NYC?" He's also uh, crying with an emotion. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, NYC. Definitely going to be doing a show here, a proper, like my last big show was uh, Hammerstein Ballroom. That was mm. a great show. Great. It's a great venue. Um, so I, I have two projects coming out, musical projects. I have mm -hmm. my, I have a um, hip hop EP working with Lil Uzi Vert, Lil Yachty, Migos, um, Wale and a bunch of other two chains. Cool. So I have that project coming out. Then I have Neon Future 3 coming out. Mm -hmm. Which has, uh, you know, a bunch of collaborations, um, and my my biggest single of all time. That's that's really I, I just can't I, I I can't thank all the fans so uh, enough, and and my collaborator and and uh, my partner in crime in the song Louis Tomlinson with Just Hold On. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredible, you know, just you know, just just you know, seeing the the growth of this song get to the place where it's gone. I was like, we we just today we hit 100 million streams. Wow. On Spotify. I was one of them. 
<laughs> Thank you. No, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's just incredible. When uh, so with Spotify, you're also working with Spotify on the ANA playlist, yes, right? Yes. So yes. tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So, I first of all, I love making playlists. You do. Uh, yeah, I mean, what's I was, your? Do you have a favorite playlist that you've made of all time? Um. I mean, there's a few, but but like talking about the ANA stuff, it's it's like those playlists are cool because. You know, like it's easy to make a playlist of songs that you already know and you love, but when they hit me up to do a playlist of like cool Japanese music, and I'm like, oh, this is exciting because I I want to take this project on and learn, mm -hmm. and I, I want to expose myself to the new music and and find out what I call I was calling my friends. I'm like, what are you guys listening to out there? That's that's breaking. That's underground. That's what like, is it? Tell me. Let's 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 well, hear it. Well, what the, is it? The best way to find out is just listen to the playlist. <laughs> just go, what just a tease! Like down, download. The, I'm I'm serious because there's a lot of music. I I like, I stacked and stacked tons of music. Not just like the underground stuff, but like all the cool pop stuff. Because the thing about Japanese music, is that you have to go there and then you'll find out about it. You, mm. It's not like with American pop music. You'll everyone knows Chainsmokers or. Calvin Harris or Rihanna or you know whoever else is breaking out here, but in Japan, the biggest pop artist is probably not known to a, someone not here. So you get a mix of everything all combined in these different playlist categories I made for ANA. The way we discover music now is, I think, so much different than what it was 12, 15, 20 years oh, ago. Yeah. And for an artist like you, it seems to be really conducive. I mean, especially artists who are like you, but like you 10 years ago. And now they have so many outlets between YouTube and Spotify and SoundCloud. What's your advice to the young emerging artists out there who are trying to get heard? Probably the same thing you were talking about. Like, you, you now you have the power in your hands. You have um, TuneCore if you want to release it to iTunes. You have SoundCloud if you want to just throw demos up. Um, you don't need a label necessarily. You don't need an institution to put, put your music out. You just, I think what the most important thing is, you need to get your music circulated. Mm -hmm. It's not about making money off your music. You have to get your music out there. You need it like circulating ar around this, uh, the, the crowd of music that would actually value your music. And there's so many sub, 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 sub genres now mm -hmm. that you just focus inside that sub genre and and become you know of you know just like build that community yeah, building the community mm -mm. and and that's what's important you need to communicate and talk to those artists and and if your music's good and they, they support then it's like almost like a tier structure that just grows into a larger community and a larger community and then all of a sudden it gets to the point where a big artist is like all right because the big artists especially djs Mm -hmm. are looking in all the communities. Mm. Is that what you do? I, I, yeah, I do that all the time. I mean, I also run my own label, so right. I'm always looking for, it doesn't matter if you're a 15-year-old kid from Tennessee working off your laptop in your, in your bedroom, or you're, you know, you're a veteran producer that, you know, that's been producing hits all day long. It, it's like, I want to hear, I want to hear the best of everything. Yeah. You know, and you could be that 15-year-old kid that's just, pushing out the most unique sounds and you, you team them up with with great songwriters and you that you can have something unique and fresh that that could could like really connect with a lot of, a lot of people not just a small core what's your go-to song right now if you want to pick me up um to to, to like pre-game yeah um well right now i'm really into like all the like all the new hip-hop like little uzi vert Mm -hmm. He's been crushing it. I've I've been lucky because I, I was uh, I was able to work with him for a week before his extremely incredible success from 2016. All his hits. Um, we did we did a bunch of songs together, and I'm excited to get that that music out. If there's one person that you could collaborate with, you haven't yet. I mean, Linkin Park, Snoop Lion, Fall Out Boy, Afro Jack. You have collaborated with everyone at this point. Is there anyone out there you haven't that you would just um, love to do? I mean, there's a there's a ton. There's there's so many. I like my recent collaboration with Louis Louis Tomlinson was mm -hmm. has been the, has been the most rewarding. 
Just Why that, is that? Like, on a creative level, working with him, like sometimes I work with artists and they just come and they do a vocal and they're out and that's fine. And I, and I totally dig that and I love that. But with Louie on this song, we worked together from point A to point Z, like all the way through, um, even through promotions, like we're, you know, we're like brothers in, in this, working on the song. You know, we work equally as strong and hard on the song and we performed Jimmy Fallon, we did Today Show, um, and we're doing all kinds of stuff around it, and and um, and it's and it's like touched so many people. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's incredible to see like the One Direction fan base is is something else, man. Like the, the fan base is, is an institution in itself. They just they really get behind the music and they they work it. You know, so it's it's cool to to be a part of his world. What he's he's been doing for you know all those years. I've talked to artists in the past who talk about these collaborations and. Some of them can be uh, a little fake. You know, it's like, really, these three guys got together, or gals, women, whatever, yeah. all got together and did a song, and it's right. kind of like the label pushed them all together. Yeah, yeah right, right. Um, do you, as an artist, do you feel like it's different? Do, do you feel like you hear it differently, the music, yeah. when you know that it's legit, that these are friends versus yeah. the manufactured, we all were in separate studios recording our part and someone well, laid the you know, tracks over some, each other? Sometimes you don't know because like it's, a, a good song's a good song. Like, if it's if it's done if produced and written the right way mm -hmm. um you know like i I'll, sometimes i don't know the story behind it you know um it, Ju it, uh juanita yeah. brakeman wants to know would you work with ricky reed ricky what ricky reed i now i need to know who what who he is juanita you'll have to give us a little yeah. more detail on that i'm Thanks. gonna i'm gonna look out for ricky reed now <laughs> uh, thank you for that i'm gonna how involved are you in the business side of your label um for in the very beginning, I, w I did everything. Now we have a full-scale team. Um, it's like a like 15 people, 15 people working full-time on the music side. Even on the fashion side, it's a completely different team. So, um, like for me, on uh, in the Dimox side, I'm more A and R and um, development. I come in and you know, in and out. Like I'm I'm never in the office. You know, my yeah. my office is my yeah. Studio. What is your office? Right, my your studio. studio. Yeah, so. Like we have a we have a really great uh, floor in a building in downtown LA, and I've sectioned off an area for my studio and like a lounge for all the artists that come through and I work with, and then the the, the rest of the building is is just like you know multimedia and you know the whole operations of the business. Least favorite part of your job? Um, probably the part I don't really deal with. Which I'm happy with the management deal with, mm. kind of like all the red tape and bureaucracy and putting out a record. Like the creative side is great, and then you like pass that over to legal, and then like they're just fighting back and forth over like things that I'm just like, come on, like <laughs> like if if we if me and the artist were able to get get it done, it would be so much faster. And it's like, what are the things legal fights over in the music industry? Um. I, I'm not even like I don't even like know the de rights like, and all that stuff. Yeah, like there's so many details in like this, that, and the other. I'm not, <laughs> you know, and I don't really get involved. It's I nice just know, that you yeah. can wash your hands of it. Right, Have right, some, right. Pay some good people to do that job so you can get out and enjoy it. Yeah. What's What's the most surprising thing to you? You know, as a kid, when you maybe dreamt of having this life, what's the thing that you didn't expect from all of it? Um, when I was a kid, I was. I was dreaming of being a bigger artist. I, I definitely didn't think I was going to become a DJ because I was in mm -hmm. bands and I didn't even know anything about DJing. So when I was a kid, I was like, I just want to play. I just want people to sing along to my songs that I make. I want there to be this connection, a real distinctive connection. I didn't think I'll be playing outside of living rooms or like basements because that's all I was playing in front of them. Like maybe like these, these like, you know, illegal warehouse events, parties, whatever you want to call them. Um, what was it like the first time you performed in front of 8,000 people? I was... What went through your head? Nervous, crazy nervous. I um, I mean, I'd say like it would probably be Coachella 2009, like when I introduced the the um, boats and the, the water guns and stuff. Yeah. I prepped for the show. Like I really was like, okay, at, at my fourth song, I'm going to do this. I brought like, I made like, I was sewing and knitting 
like capes and stuff <laughs> like for my dancers like, I was really involved in the, in the fashion decor as well you know not just uh, everything I was thinking about every way to present the show but I was nervous as all hell you know of course I was nervous you know I'm still I still get like I'm really nervous actually for my fashion show tomorrow really because, yeah because it's a completely different wheel it's a different wheelhouse it's a different creative outlet and I I want to make sure it's presented the, right, the way I, I see it and that people will understand what I'm trying to show, you know? So I'm so excited that everyone's going to see this collection because I think this collection's unique and it's going to stand out. I'm excited to see it. Yeah. Well, we're rooting for you. Um, you. Oh, Juanita Brakeman, since, since we don't, she's the same woman who asked about Ricky Reed. Okay. So she also asks comfort food and hobbies. Comfort food, is that like carbs or something? Sure. Do you like, do you eat carbs? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I'm not proud of it. I guess like, you know, I, cause I, I mean, I was excited like today, this morning, I, w I woke up at 6 a.m. and did a like high intensity training workout at seven, went for a run in this cold <laughs> New York Wow, weather. it is really cold, yeah. Um, comfort food. I mean, I do like sweets, like, you know, I like, I like some cake. Swedish I mean, fish. Obviously, oh, you like cake? I, yeah. I, like, that's I don't why really you incorporated cake. cake into your act. I guess so. So that's you can like, eat it backstage. My, that's like my, my, my indulging moments. Maybe <laughs> I like eat in the back. I don't want anyone to know that though. Oh, right. Don't tell So anyone. like that's a secret, the like, only exclusive secret here. <laughs> uh, I always ask everyone who comes on the show, worst advice you've ever received? Worst, wow, that's a good one. Worst, usually I forget about those. Good. I, I should remember them. Worst advice. Um, well, I guess like um, sometimes the worst advice becomes like your your like goal to beat, you know, like like when someone says you can't do something, mm -hmm. like you can't make it. You you always want to show them up, and so maybe maybe it's like something around that kind of vibe. Because like when someone tells you like there's no way you can do that, there's no way you can, you can, um, you know, like, I don't know if it's the worst advice because it's sometimes it's the best advice. Hmm. Telling you you can't do something yeah. is good advice. No, yeah, because because you use it. Oh, it fuels you. Yeah, it motivates right. you. Yeah. So you have to take it, and like, you know, like it's like looking at life glass half full or glass half empty, right? It's like you can. You could like, let's say you're in a club, and you're like, I'm bored, I hate this, this sucks. It's like, well, you could take the good elements of why you're there or what, what it is that you enjoy about it and focus on that, right? So um, that's, a, that's the same way to look at uh, when someone tells you, you can't do something. And you got to think, what, what can you do so that you can like actually do it? How can you do it and prove them wrong? Awesome. Steve Aoki, thank you so thank much you. for joining me. Good luck tomorrow and good luck at the Grammys.